Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and this episode is powered by Stick and Ball TV. I'm excited to announce that Ahead of the Curve is now part of the Stick and Ball TV family. Stick and Ball TV is the baseball and softball streaming platform dedicated to coach and player development. It features hundreds of videos from top baseball and softball coaches and leading brands. There are literally hundreds of videos across all parts of the game, and I am so thankful to be a part of the community that they have built. We want you to join the community so bad that we are giving away one free month to each of you. Use the code AOTC2021 for a free month and check it out at Stick and Ball TV or on the Stick and Ball app on the App Store. Once again, that's AOTC2021, all lowercase. On today's show, we have on Robin Lund, pitching coach for the University of Iowa. Robin was born in Northern Alberta, Canada, in an area where there was very little baseball, and his parents let him move to Lewiston, Idaho when he was in ninth grade and live with a host family just to play high school baseball. He then played at Spokane Falls Community College and Whitworth University. After playing, he coached at Spokane Falls CC for four years, working with hitters and outfielders, while also serving as the strength and conditioning coach. During that time, he got his master's degree in exercise science from Eastern Washington University, and then got out of coaching to pursue a PhD. While working on it, he was Ed Chef's strength and conditioning coach at Lewis and Clark State College. And when Robin completed his degree in 2002, he landed a tenure track position in the Department of Kinesiology in Cedar Falls, Iowa. After 18 years, he got back into coaching and became the volunteer assistant for the University of Northern Iowa softball team in the fall of 2018. In January of 2019, he took the job at the University of Iowa where he started as the hitting coach and then became the pitching coach in the fall of 2020. So on the show, we go over player assessments, developing motor learning plans, and blending the art of science and coaching. This will feature both pitching and hitting, and I think you're going to love this episode with Robin Lund. Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Definitely. Well, I'm, I'm excited to get to interview you today. I, I think, well, I, I mean, besides high school coaches, you're probably the only coach I've ever had on that has coached both hitters and pitchers, and especially at the Division One level. And, and so I'm really excited uh, I know that that the guests got to hear your your background, which is really really interesting. But we're going to go ahead and jump into just the regular content section, and let's rewind a little bit. We're recording this at the end of December, and so let's let's record or rewind back to August. And so you're you're getting new players on campus. Uh, you're getting players that have just spent well, I mean, almost six months probably in in this year away from you guys because the season was canceled and we had so much going on. But let's let's go over kind of your, what are your first steps when guys get back to campus and especially with your new players that you're recruiting, what are some of the first things that you do when evaluating these new players and, and trying to figure out, you know, what you can do for them, how you can develop player development plans, and then really what, what you guys are going to be doing in the fall? Absolutely. Our first thing uh, right away is to get uh, just a full-blown assessment done. That's uh, mobility, motor control, strength. Um, we we just actually hired a, a brand new athletic trainer. His name's Ike Ogata. Um, he was in the Cubs organization for the last three years, and um, he's developed his own uh, assessment. And so he's he, we just now finally got it done. Like normally we would get this thing done literally before we would even be working out with the guys. Um, we have a, we have a, a physical therapist that's helped us in the past. So we, we do it a lot earlier than we did this year. Um, but it's, again, it's the same, it's, it's all the stuff that you guys hear, right? Like ankle mobility, hip mobility, T-spine mobility, you know, scap stability, some motor control stuff with the core and the scaps and, uh, strength with the rotator cuff and, and all that, all that stuff that you, that you normally would get. Um, and so we try to get that done right away. Um, we don't do much with it, uh, after we get it at the beginning, um, we'll dig into that stuff a little bit later once the fall ends, but once we get them assessed, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm constantly coach Heller's reminding me is like, Hey, these guys are, this is kind of an evaluation period, um, when these guys first show up. And so you got to watch, you know, tinkering too much with guys. I mean, you have to give them an opportunity to compete and, 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 and do a nice job on the mound when we're scrimmaging, because this is a big evaluation period. It's going to be a big part of the equation when we're determining who's getting innings when we start playing games. So we, we leave them alone. Um, after we do the assessment for a little while, um, 
I right away get modus sleeves on them. Our guys all wear the modus sleeve. Um, I want to get a sense of uh, how much they throw each week, what days they they you know play long toss, what days they want to throw bullpens, and just kind of see how they operate. I don't I don't bug them too much. I just want to see what they're doing and, and get a sense of like mainly how much they like to throw. Um, you'd be shocked, especially the freshmen, how they come in. And it's like almost, literally almost every guy's like, hey, you need to be throwing more is, is essentially what happens. But we get that sleeve on them for about three or four weeks and we just kind of watch. Um, another thing we do is I have them, uh, I give them a worksheet and I have them write down their kind of their pre-throw routine, their activation routine, literally everything they do. And it's funny, some of the guys that are just like, well, I don't really know what to write down because they don't really have a plan. So forcing them to, to kind of write down what they do. We have a good look at that. And then finally, what they do after they're throwing, we want to we want to see what they're doing um, for their post their routine. A um, couple reasons for that, obviously, number one, I want to know what they do, what they like, reasons they do it. Um, but more importantly, I want them to begin the process of knowing themselves. I want them, and you know, I say this all the time: know thyself. You got to understand what it is that makes you tick, what it is that you do, and it kind of just starts with like just describe to me what it is that you do. Um, so from there, we we just kind of let them. We just kind of let them go a little bit, like I said, for a little while. Once we get we get an idea what they're doing from a pre-throw and a post-throw program, um, I will send them out some resources, right? I'll send them out some some videos that outline, you know, here's all here's a menu of all the different things that you can do in our program to get your body and your arm, you know, ready to throw. Um, you know, all the plyo care stuff, med, med ball stuff, core velocity stuff, shoulder tubes, J bands, like all of those modalities. We present all of that to them. And then from there, it's just like, okay, start messing around with this stuff, explore, experiment, talk to the older guys, get an idea of what it is you're doing. And then we'll have them, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that when the fall ends and have a good look at that, um, at the routine and see if it's changed at all. And then once we get into the, the rest of the assessment, which we can talk about a little bit later, um, then we'll, we'll start making adjustments to their, to their routines. I love that. And so you're giving them a, almost a, just a trial period before you get started and I help, help us out with this because this is something that I, that I think a lot of people are doing, but they don't necessarily know what to do with it yet. And so you, you start to see a lot of different screens popping up, you know, on base, you being one that, that I, you know, I went through that I thought was really, really good. Uh, but then you, I have been guilty of this too, and which is why I'm asking of you take the assessment and then you see what they do. And then you just kind of, it's a, it's a box to check almost. And I'm not saying, you know, obviously I'm not saying that you do that, but I know that I have been guilty of that in the past. So after you, after you take the assessment, let's say you give them this trial period, then what do you really start to dig into and what, and how do you, how do you really use it? Yeah. So we get that assessment, um, all that stuff's in there. And, and it, there's a few other things we get on the assessment side, like Zach Walrod, our, our strength coach. Um, he gets a lot of force plate data on our guys. So their ability mm -hmm. to, to generate force concentrically, eccentrically. Um, we have some of our pitchers with uh, Omega waves um, that just kind of test. It's like a whoop band on steroids, just really high level um, piece of equipment. So we're, we're getting all this data. And I guess leading to your question, like, what, what do you do with it? When we get done in the fall um, and we're getting ready to play the fall world series, their last bullpen that they're going to, that they throw for us, um, we have them throw that pen and then we send them into the development center. Um, they take their shirt off, they put some, some shorts on and they give us three more good fastballs inside. And we use, um, we have some pretty high quality um, high speed video cameras. We have edutronics and, and, some other, some other things. And we'll get video from, from three different angles. So the two side angles and from behind, and then they, we just send them on their way. And then from there, um, we have three or four managers, uh, what was it? Who was it? Creighton Rudolph and Bailey Rezo. And I think there was one, uh, Ryan Gorman were our three managers that were really, really into this this year. Uh, myself, our strength coach and our athletic trainer, we watch these videos and, you know, we, we would love to have a motion capture lab, a three-dimensional motion capture lab. I, I ran a biomechanics lab at the University of Northern Iowa for seven years. So I would love to have one of those, but we don't yet. We're, we're working on it. And so we do the next best thing. We do what's called a qualitative assessment. So I've developed a, uh, a checklist. It's like a qualitative, you know, survey. It's three pages long. And, and we take those videos. Our managers will chunk them up into the different components. So they'll basically create smaller videos of just the hip load, the ride, rotation, uh, deceleration, just the arm, 
um, and chunk those up. And then you watch that on a loop. So you watch the guy get into his hip on a loop over and over and over just that section of the pitching motion. And then all of a sudden things just stick out and you see certain inefficiencies or things that you want to work on. So we basically, as a team go in there, we watch all those videos. We come up with what we think are some of the, the main if inefficiencies in each guy's movement and then make a decision, right? We got to pick the one that we're going to work on. We don't want to do any, any more than just like one and then maximum two things if they're really related and really close to one another. But usually for each guy, it's just one. So again, the most common things are going to be like, you know, do they get into their hip eff effectively? Um, what's their ride look like? Um, do they hold counter rotation? Um, those kinds of things. Um, and so once you figure out, okay, this is the one thing that we're going to try to improve with those guys. Now it's time to dig into that assessment. Okay. So if you have a guy that has an issue um, getting into his rear hip, or maybe he doesn't ride uh, the slope very well and that, that back knee starts collapsing. Okay. Does he, is he limited in rear hip internal rotation? Um, does he, is he limited in that rear foot is a dorsiflexion problem or eversion issue with that rear foot? So once you identify an issue that you want to check, um, that's when that assessment comes important. You start digging in there and make sure that they're not, their, their inability to do the move the way you'd like them to do it isn't because of a mobility or a strength issue or an imbalance or something, or a, you basically want to make sure they're capable of doing it before you, you start diving into this motor learning plan. Oh, that's really good. And so the, you being, you know, more of a biomechanics expert than I am, but I'm, I'm starting to dig into it quite a bit. And it seems like you're talking about joint movement and the, the this is just, again, very, a very amateur opinion on it. It's really, it's really hard to fix or it takes a long time to be able to fix it. And so you, you get these joint by joint movement screens and you're assessing them for, you know, stability, mobility. Uh, you're seeing whether or not they're, it's the same on both sides too, which, which I'm sure, uh, if they have any asymmetries, I guess you would say. And then one of the things, that's just one of the things that I've noticed is that it's really hard to fix uh, in, in an efficient manner quickly. And so maybe some things, I guess, and, and this is kind of me leading to me asking you about if that's correct or if that's not, but let's say that they do have some, it's not an asymmetry issue. They have bad uh, hip internal rotation or ankle mobility on both sides. Uh, and it, is that something that you look to fix or is it something that you look to, okay, maybe they're, this is just the way that they were born. And so we can figure out a way for them to move more efficiently with what they've got. Like, is, is there a balance there? I mean, hundred percent. I mean, that's where you really got to rely on your athletic trainer. Is this like, is this a bony issue? Is a bony stop? Um, is sometimes like we just found out one of our hard throwing right-handed um, freshman pitchers had a really bad ankle injury um, when he was younger. And so that, that, are you really going to be able to fix that if you broke that ankle and had it surgically repaired? So, yeah. So like that, that's really, to me, the, the, the whole purpose of the screen is yeah. Okay. Well, you've been red flag somewhere, but now we got to dig in and we got to find out like what's causing that, that mobility. Mm -hmm. issue. Um, if it's soft tissue, you go to work on it. Um, we're, we're blessed here. Um, Zach Walrod, our strength coach is uh, certified in the functional range conditioning, all the, those functional anatomy seminars, the FRC systems. And so we, we do one, one hour a week, all of our, every guy, um, does one hour a week of mobility training with our strength coach. I mean, we, we set it aside. We think it's important. And, 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 and just to kind of close the loop on that anecdote, the right-handed pitcher that had the broken ankle, um, he actually has improved his range of motion using these techniques. And so <clears throat> you do have to make sure that they're capable of improving, but that's just going to be one piece, right? Like, so when you're trying to get somebody to move a certain way, um, even if, the kind of the initial problem with the movement pattern is because of some mobility issue, you still have to program in drills and, and you got to cue properly and, and you still have to work on the, on the actual movement pattern itself. So you still have to continue to work on it while you're working on the mobility, if that makes sense. I, but, but to your point, if, if you're not working on the mobility, if you, if you think the mobility is a problem and you're not working on it while you're doing the motor learning stuff, it's not going to work. Okay, cool. I just, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that, that I wasn't, you know, again, I'm very amateur in the biomechanics realm and, and you've had a, basically a decade or more of, of experience in it. And so, you know, you, you come up with these theories and, and, and so I just, you know, I, I love being able to, to ask guys like you, uh, those questions just because I think it, that it's truly important. And, and I think that whenever we start to, you know, 
start to dig into some of these trends like movement screens, which is a big, big deal, we need to understand how we are going to use it. <laughs> and I've, again, guilty as charged here of, of jumping into a new trend without understanding it completely and how we're going to use it, the people that we have and who we're going to use it on and all of these different questions. And, and I think that that's something that I'm trying to do a really a much better job of in 20, at the end of 2020, 2021 and going forward of having a specific plan for how I'm going to use the things that we want. Because like you said, there, I think everybody goes through an experimental stage of trying to figure out that part, but trying to cut down that as much as possible and developing a system around, you know, what we're going to do, how we're trying to do it. And, and it sounds like you guys are doing a, a fantastic job with that. And, and I, I know that, that you have a, a, you love the, the, the art of blending, uh, just really the art of coaching and the science and tech side of it. So kind of, can you go into detail about that for, for me and for our guests? I mean, for me, you know, I coached as a, as a younger man for, for a while and then jumped into the academic side. So for 20 years, I was coaching little kids, you know, I coached my, so it wasn't like I stopped coaching, but I was just coaching little kids. I wasn't coaching college guys. But, um, so for me, when I jumped back into it at the division one level, you have to fall back on your strength. So obviously like the, the science piece and the tech and the data, that's, that's where I go. That's, that's my default, you know, having taught stats and research methods and all that stuff, that's where I go. But, you know, I think that the arguments that we see, you know, like the old school versus new school stuff, and you, you, you see all the Twitter beefs that are out there. I just think it's silly because it's all information and, you know, it's not a zero sum game. You can, you can collect data, you can use tech, you can have all that stuff. But like, I use a metaphor with our guys, like the, the old school scales, you know, those uh, mechanical beam scales where you got the, the larger mass that you move it an increment to get to like a hundred, 150, 200 pounds. And then you got the smaller one that you slide to do the pound by pound increments. That's kind of mm -hmm. how I view tech and intuition, right? Uh, the technology and the science is that big one. It gets you in the ballpark. It gets you close. Um, and then you got to use a little bit of intuition and some common sense and, and just some old, just some old school relationship building and, and talking and communicating with your, with your guys to, to get things fine tuned. Cause at the end of the day, um, you put these plans together for guys and, and we can, we can talk more about how we develop these plans here in a little bit, but you put these plans together. If they're not a hundred percent bought in, it doesn't matter. Like, so, the, the, the whole relationship piece is, is, again, another really critical part of this. But for me, you know, to, to ignore, you know, Rick Heller has been a head baseball coach for 30 years. You know, for me to ignore when he sees me doing something and he goes, hey, have you thought of it this way? Because of, you know, 30 years of experience and, and all the myriad of things that he's seen and done. For me to ignore what he has to say is, is insane. It's just like, why wouldn't you consider all the information? So that's kind of how I feel about that. I love that. Tell us more about your, the plans that you're talking about. Are you talking about the motor learning plans or like your, your year long uh, no, the programming? Motor, yeah, so the motor learning plans. So, so once we've decided, you know, every guy, okay, hey, so, you know, here's, you know, you got your particular guy and, and we want him to hold counter rotation a little bit better. Um, so we've identified this, this pattern, this thing that we want to kind of uh, nudge in, in the way he throws and just kind of move it along a little bit. Um, First thing, again, what we got to do is we got to look at that, that, that pre-throwing plan and we will start to maybe take some things out um, and add some different things in um, and essentially create as many different drills as we can that will allow him to feel this movement pattern that we're, that we're trying to, that we're trying to get him to um, incorporate in the way he moves. And so, you know, I like to think of drills. I, for me, the way I like to think of drills is I, I kind of bucket them in, in one of two different categories, either they're assistive in nature um, or they're resistive, right? They either make it easier for do, to do the move or they make it more difficult for you to do the move, right? And so early on, we try to choose drills that will be more assistive in nature. And so we will just incorporate that into their pre-throwing program. Well, our guys are throwing six days a week and they're going to spend 30 to 45 minutes every day prior to throwing doing soft tissue, doing, you know, heating up their arm, doing all these things, but they're also doing core velocity belt drills. They're doing medicine ball drills. They're doing stuff with PVC pipes. They're throwing plyo care balls. And so all of those drills that we um, put into their pre-throwing plan, those are all going to have the same singular focus. Like that guy, everything that guy does on, and all of those drills, everything is designed for him to hold counter rotation. That's really all we're going to focus on. Um, I found that just, you get guys doing more than one thing and it, and it doesn't work. So 
that singular focus is really, really important. So once we get their, their motor learning plan put together, um, and again, this is also going to include some things in the weight room. Like we're really lucky, you know, Zach and, and Ike, our, our strength coach and our athletic trainer, they're totally on board. They're a part of this process of developing these plans. And so, you know, they're also, you know, doing, you know, they're making adjustments to things that are happening post throw in the athletic training room and as well as in the weight room during, during workouts. And so, so before we uh, actually start in on the plan, we take a, I take a, I make a video for each guy. We take um, either a side video, the, the same videos we had where their shirts were off. And I just voice over, here's what I'm thinking. These videos are four to five minutes. I try to pull in as much science, anatomy, um, as much stuff as I can come up with to basically put as much propaganda as I can together in a four to five minute video of why, hey, if you can just hold counter rotation a little bit longer, you're going to be a dude. You're going to throw, get, you know, you're going to throw so hard. You're going to be so good if you can do this. So you're basically trying to get them sold on this concept during, during the video. Then during Indies week, which is usually right after that, um, I'll, I'll schedule a time. You're going to come in for one hour with me, just me and you by yourself, one, one on one. And the first thing I'm going to ask is, okay, you know, you watched your video Inter tell me, tell me what you, what you got from that. What's your interpretation of everything I said on that? So number one, I got to make sure that they really get what it is I'm talking about. If we're, if they don't, you know, they might be able to regurgitate. Yeah. I need to hold kind of rotation. You need to prove to me that you understand exactly what I mean by that and how it's going to benefit you. So that's number one. Once, once they've convinced me that, that they really understand what we're talking about, then we go ahead and we just walk through, we go through the whole, the whole routine, the 30 to 40 minute routine. And I show them each drill that we want to do. Um, we walk through it. I, I, I name it. I, I give them different cues. Some of the cues are internal. I know that sometimes is a dirty word, internal cues, but the drills that are really slow and feel based, like things with like maybe a PVC pipe where they're just doing things nice and slow. I'm going to cue that stuff internally. I want them to, to feel what their body's doing. And then as they increase their intent and they're starting to move faster, we're going to switch over to, to more of an external cueing strategy. But we want to get through all of that stuff and, and make sure they don't have any questions, make sure they understand everything and, and how each drill is linked to holding counter rotation. Now, at the end of that, the end of that whole process, the last thing I leave them with is, okay, this is an arbitrary starting point. None of these drills are magic. It's just that we are giving you lots of different opportunities for you to solve this particular movement problem, right? We want you to get really good at, at creating solutions for this movement problem. And so in order for you to get good at that, you have to practice doing this in lots of different um, environments and different uh, situations and with different implements and with, you know, medicine balls and with core velocity belts, you basically want to throw lots of variability. So they get tons of practice making these, making this again, solving this, this particular problem. At the end of the day, I tell them like, this is an arbitrary starting point. None of these drills are magic. Your intent is what is magic. And in three weeks, you need to be exploring and experimenting and messing around. And in three weeks, I'm going to ask you, you know, what, what's different about your plan? What have you adjusted to make it yours? Like, and so that autonomy piece, when they get in there and they just like, oh, I have, I have, this is my program. I have the freedom to get in there. Not only the freedom, but there's an expectation that you start making adjustments to this plan. Um, then they own it. And then they have skin in the game. And uh, I think that just increases the probability that that the, the change that we're trying to make is, is eventually going to happen. And then when it happens, it's going to be more stable. No, I, I want to highlight a couple of different things that I think are super important. The first one, because I love this, by the way, Robin, you're doing a fantastic job with these, uh, which I, I I'm sure you already know that, but I want to make sure that you do. But uh, the first thing is is learning one thing at a time, like not giving them just a, a mouthful of just, hey, here's 17 different things that you need to be doing. And then we're, we're going to reassess because I know, again, speaking to the crowd, but I've done that, too, where the players just looks at you like, OK, I need to do do what now? And I, I really like because basically the brain can only focus on one thing at a time anyway. So giving them literally one takeaway, I really like that. I also love that that you you do the voiceover, then you go over it with them, and then you ask them for feedback. Which again, it, it's just going to get them to buy in more. And then once they're able to own part of their process, then they're going to own more of their career. And so I just again, I, I wanted to highlight a couple of those things because I, I think that that that's really good. So, but you did coach hitters and. I want want to flip it a little bit on you because we we talked a, a lot about pitching right there. I'm sure the hitting process would be very similar, but what would be different if you 
got flipped again and you were coaching hitters next year. Yeah, I, I got to, I actually got to do this twice. And what's funny is the, it, it is a little bit different, um, with the pitching and the hitting, um, I, the, with the hitting side, I got a lot of influence from, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. His great, great Twitter account, Zona Baseball, Trent, Trent, uh, Otis, Trent Otis, Trent Otis. Yes. Sorry. Um, he, he put together a really good, um, series of drill and going through his stuff was the first time I kind of had the aha moment. I was like, none of these drills are magic. Like it's, it's the variability that that's really important. And, and again, the singular focus to me is, is also really important. And so I, I took a lot of, uh, you know, Trent, I got a lot of influence from, from Trent Otis on this, but when I was at, at the university of Northern Iowa, um, for that one fall as a volunteer and I, I had hitters for the fall, um, you know, those girls hit, I think you can go, you can go look at the numbers. I, I don't remember. I think they hit under 20 home runs. I think the year before I got there and, um, I got there in the fall and I was, I was kind of going through a bunch of stuff and I was explaining to everybody, like when you hit doubles, when, the, when this team, I just, I, I did a big analysis. I don't have to get into how I did all that stuff, but I basically was able to show them when you hit a, a double in an inning, you score 70% of those innings. Like, let's, so let's just start with that. Let's get really good at hitting doubles. So now let's look at the anatomy of a double. What's a double. Okay. So most doubles are, are, are hit when they're at an egg for a softball, an exit velocity above 60 miles an hour and between 10 and 25 degrees of launch angle. Lots of ways to hit a double. You can hit a ground ball down the left field line, down the right field line, but more often than not, it's something that's in that range. So we basically just went, okay, what are the, what are the three things we're going to work on from a, from a technical standpoint? Uh, we worked on the getting into their hip. We worked on a really slow and quiet move forward, landing into like a balance point. So the forward move. And then we just worked on working up through the softball. Like that's it. Those the, just a bat path. So those three things. And so the first two or three weeks of the fall was rear hip week. Every drill that we did, was a rear hip focus. They got a video on the, just like a 30 minute video on, on the rear hip and, and how it leads to, uh, you know, how it's going to help you, you know, hit more doubles and all just all sorts of propaganda. And it just ended with all of our drills, explaining all of our drills. So for, and then we put the hand, the launch angle ropes everywhere, obviously for 10 to 25 degrees. And then, uh, obviously, but then we had a hitting rap soda unit that every time they took a swing, they're getting feedback on that. So, the next two weeks after that, or so weeks three and four, we did the forward move. So we took out all the drills, we switched them out, we put all new drills in, and it was all about the forward move. And again, there was a video, tons of propaganda of why the forward move is so important for adjustability and, you know, just laying the groundwork, laid out all the new drills, put it together. Same thing, hitting everything in the launch angle ropes, collecting data on exit below and, and launch angle using the Rapsodo. Um, and then finally, the third piece was just working up through the softball, same thing, putting the drills together. Um, then unfortunately I left, um, well, fortunately I got, I got an actual coaching job. It wasn't a volunteer and I left, but so I didn't, I didn't get to see the season through, but you know, that's that spring, those girls hit almost 60 home. I think they had 59 or 60 home runs and they broke the single season record, um, with essentially the same kids. And, and all that was, was one outcome measure just above 63 miles an hour in the launch angle range and then basically folks, you know, let's pick three things that we're going to, that we're going to try to tighten up from a mechanical standpoint on each kid that's going to help them get there. And then just, just kind of track the data and watch it happen. We did a similar, um, a similar deal, uh, two falls ago. I wasn't the hitting coach at the time, but, uh, Jake Yosinich was our, was, was running it, did something similar here. And we had, we saw a very similar, um, you know, uh, outcomes from the beginning of the fall to the end of the fall. No, that's great. And, and uh, again, I, I'm, I may flip back and forth between those just because I, I you, again, you've got such an interesting background that it, it, it would be a shame for me to not, to not be able to do that. So with whenever we're making new changes, so you, I think you said it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was three weeks whenever you're trying a different program and then you're kind of reevaluating. Is, is that right? You no. Know, so w- with the hitting thing, we did three weeks, two to three weeks and then, you know, some kids get it sooner than others. Um, and then we moved on to the next thing and we moved on to the next thing. After that, as a coaching staff, we would just evaluate, okay, so, you know, this kid does a really good job of the, the rear hip, but the forward move is not great. So we're just going to stick with the forward move now as we move forward with this kid. So you can kind of bucket them after that um, 
in the different areas that you want to, that you want to focus on was kind of how we approached it. Um, okay. And I know when you ask, you know, how long does it take? If I, if I flip back to the, the pitching side, you know, I know that was a, that was a question you wanted to talk about, you know, like how long do you kind of let that go um, when trying to make a change on the pitching side? You know, I don't have a timeline. I don't even really think about it. Um, we're going to go as long as it, as it takes essentially. Um, we, we do a, we do a cognition test. I don't know if you've heard of, um, S2 cognition. Have you heard of that company? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. actually. So in instructs, I, I got to, I actually took it. I don't know what my score yeah. was, but okay. it, was, it was tough. I took it too. Yeah. So you, you're familiar with that. And then the one metric on there is that the, the motor control metric, I don't know if you remember that one. And essentially, you know, a higher score mm-hmm. indicates that you can make changes to the way you move quicker and a lower score mm-hmm. means it's going to take more time. And for me, that, that particular score has been, you know, so, gold. I mean, it's been so great for us because our guys understand it's like, look, we're going to try to get, if you can, first of all, like, again, remember, if you can learn to hold counter rotation more, you're going to be so good. Like you're going to be an, you're already good, but you're going to be a dude when we get this figured out. So this is important. Um, you also know that you didn't score very high on that particular metric. So we know this is going to take time, but it's worth it. And when they understand that they're going to be patient. When I understand it, I'm going to be patient. I'm not, I'm not going to accuse anybody of being uncoachable ever again, because some guys, it just takes longer. Um, and so, yeah, we just, I guess I don't, I would never, I think one of the worst things you can do, um, is if you decide you're going to, you're going to make a change with somebody and this is on hitting and pitching. And then you get three or four weeks into it and you're like, okay, this isn't working. And then you completely switch it out and try something else. Um, to me, that's more harmful than, than sticking with it for the long term. I got you. Cool. Yeah. That, that, I think that's always, that's part of the art of coaching too, is, is it, especially if, if you and the player both are like, eh, this, this is, maybe it's a drill. Uh, eh, this, this drill isn't having the intended outcome that I wanted. It, it is okay to switch. We can't have too much of an ego that just says, okay, no, it works for every, no, it, it, it really doesn't. And I, I think that, again, that, that comes back to the art of coaching. And, and so uh, another thing that, again, with, with a guy from your academic background, I, I know that you're into data and flipping back and forth. So, you're the hitting coach, you are looking at, okay, we can exploit a few of these different things as far as data goes. And and I'm thinking more of maybe in game. So, you know, uh, whatever it is, not getting into two strike counts by swinging and being aggressive early would be just an example of something that you could potentially exploit depending on your players. And then you go back to the pitching side and now you're like, okay, now I've seen the hitting side and, and I know what they do well. So here's something that we can counteract with that. And so uh, playing that yin and yang a little bit, which I think is really, really cool. But let's start with what, with whatever side that you want. And so what are some things that pitchers or, or maybe pitching coaches or, or for game planning purposes, some different things as far as data goes that that you feel like more pitchers need to do a better job of exploiting this, this, and this? Or maybe it could just be like one thing and then we'll flip it on you. And, and then from the hitting side, you see this trend that's going on and it may be may or may not be a good idea. Yeah. For, so on the pitching side, you know, we use Synergy. Um, it's, a, it's a great uh, software application. I think most of the division ones use it. Um, it just allows you to sort data and get video uh, on a different bunch of different things. But one one of the things that we talk about a lot um, here at Iowa with our guys is the myth of the hitters count. Um, obviously, hitting is a reactionary thing, um, the, the, and and for pitching, everything's premeditated. So there's a, there's a huge advantage there, obviously, on the pitching side when it when it comes to that particular uh, the pitcher hitter battle, right? Um, but for us we talk about, again, the myth of the hitters count. And so when you look at those, those charts that show, you know, batting average or, or Woba or slugging percentage based on all the counts and how hitters just dominate, for example, in two Oh and three, one counts, um, you have to remember like that those data are only calculated on balls that are put in play. It's ignoring takes, it's ignoring swings and misses, it's ignoring fall balls. Right. And so, when you, so we had our managers, I basically had all my, my, our managers redo it for us and took all of the data from, um, every game, every pitch that we've thrown since we've had track man here at the university. So seven years worth of data and create new tables. And so they, there's some constraints on it. Um, number one, the pitch itself, we only include pitches that were thrown in the actual track man strike zone. So 
And then we uh, included in those probabilities, swings and misses, uh, takes, so strikes taken, and then also fall balls. And we wanted to basically answer this question for any count. What is the probability that this hitter will get a hit if I throw any particular pitch in the strike zone? And what we actually find is that some of the worst hit probabilities, when you take all that stuff into consideration, are actual hitters counts. Like, for example, like 2-0 fastball in the strike zone um, has one of the lowest hit probabilities because the take rate is actually really, really high because hitters are they're trained to be very patient, right? And very selective in a 2-0 count. We're only going to look in, you know, middle in or the inner three or something like that. And what you find is they just take a ton of fastballs for strikes. So we talk to our guys a lot about the myth of the hitters count and basically, you know, using that for to, to get them to buy into the idea that you just need to be attacking the strike zone relentlessly with all your pitches. And what about from the hitting side? What was something that, that you were like, hey guys, we this is kind of going to be our this is going to be our philosophy. Uh, again, it, it's kind of a tough question to ask because I, I have no idea, you know, what your players have been like in the past or currently. But if you were just, if you were going to look at that and say, okay, now how do we use this on the hitting side or what's something that we need to do better uh, about something similar to what you just mentioned as far as, as the hit probability ish, how did that really change your mind or how did that, how did that change something or what did that add to your game plans, your philosophy just any, anything or all of the above. For sure. Yeah. So like you, you gotta be, you know, so we're pulling all this information, like our managers kill it for us on the, on the, on the scouting side, we pull all this information together and our job, it's a little different than pro ball, right? Like in pro ball, you you actually have to get your, cause your guys are, you know, the catchers are calling the pitches. Um, pitchers are shaking off. I mean, they're kind of in control of that part of the game where we're, we're really joysticking our guys. So we need that information in front of us. And we, we really want our guys to just have, more generic generic understanding of what we're trying to do um, when they're on the mound pitching. But on the hitting side, um, it's a little bit different. We want our guys to just have a plan. We want them to get into the batter's box knowing that they have a really, really good plan you know, to put this pitcher away or beat this guy. So the type of information that we're going to give them when a new pitcher comes in are going to be things like, look, you know, um, he's what is he what does he tend to do? When you've got two strikes, what does he tend? To, where does he tend to throw his fastball? Because, like again, you know, pitchers are, are are you know they're not perfect either. Just because they're trying to throw a fastball to the glove side doesn't mean they do it well. And so we can use synergy to basically show, like, look, his fastball is ninety percent of the time his arm side. Even though he's trying to get to the glove side, he doesn't get there. So you need to be looking to this side of the plate. So we're just looking for tendencies from those pitchers that's going to allow that hitter to walk into the batter's box with just a really solid plan. Where are we looking? Um, are we going to look for pitches? Or are we going to look for locations? Just basically zoning them up and and just and being confident in that plan. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it just we want them to be very confident in in their plan. Oh, that's fantastic. That's that's the fun of being in a reactionary state <laughs> for for the entire at bat versus, you know, uh, on a mound and you can you could take as much time as you want. Uh, I, I guess unless they they have a pitch clock for everyone. But but it, it's it, it's been so interesting again getting to getting to see both sides of it because now you're let's say you're in a season and and you're in a dugout. So what are what are those conversations like? Uh, start with pitching, and then again, I I I love that you hit on the hitting side a little bit. And if you want to go more in depth with that, you can. But whenever you're having those in game, in dugout conversations with your pitchers, what are some different? I don't want to, you know, I don't I don't know what you really, you know, what your style of talking to those guys is. But I'm sure it's you know one thing at a time. But is it mechanical? Is it approach? Is it hey hit this what you're doing well this what or what do you got? Just kind of walk us through and and let's let's simulate a conversation and what that would look like. Yeah, the, one of the first things I ask our guys um, right away, I ask I always ask them this question is like number one. So when you are you're pitching really, really well. You're on. You're you're carving. Everything is 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 going well. You're dealing and you're cruising. What's going through your mind? And I haven't had anybody tell me an answer that varies differently from some form of 
I don't know. I don't really think about anything. That's a flow state. Like that is just when, when you are, are performing at a very high level and it feels effortless, right? So that flow state is what we're searching for as, as players and as coaches, we want to help our guys get there. Then I always follow up with, okay, so now you're on the mound and you're not, you're, you're struggling. Um, we're not doing well. Tell me what you're thinking about. And they can always, well, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. And so they kind of have a bit of an aha moment where it's like, oh boy, I never really put it that way. But I'll follow that up with, okay, when you're struggling, are you running hot or you're running cold? I, I need to know that about each guy so that when I have a conversation with them, whether it's a, a mound visit or I'm in the dugout with them, if he's a guy that runs hot, I'm cracking jokes. I'm trying to loosen him up, trying to make him smile, trying to get him essentially to, to relax a little bit and calm down. Um, those hyper competitive guys, right, that want to you know win at everything and, and they want to they want to dominate on everything when they struggle they'll sometimes their, their emotions and their temper can get the best of them. So I'm trying to get those guys to calm down and, and laugh a little bit. The guys that run cold, um, you know, try to wake them up, you know, um, fire them up a little bit. Uh, I, I'm a pretty, pretty calm guy myself. Like I said, my, my touch is soft and considerably after raising three children and coaching a lot of kindergartners through the years. So I, I generally don't get rel you know, too aggressive with the guys, but I, I am going to try to, to get them fired up a little bit and, you know, kickstart them a little bit. But, um, I do try to touch base with our guys after every inning, uh, no matter what. And if they're doing well, it's just, you know, it's usually just a quick touch. Hey, you're, you're doing great. Just continue to encourage them to keep up with what they're doing. And if they're not doing great, again, it's just a lot more encouragement. Um, but I do try to touch base. I haven't had anybody yet say, you know, I really like to be left alone. We had one guy like that, um, last year that was, you know, his history was he likes to be left alone. He doesn't like anybody talking to him. And, and he ended up eventually coming up and saying, you know what, I think I'll do better if you just interact with me. Cause I feel like I'm trying to keep this high level of focus, even when I'm sitting in the dugout and it's exhausting. And I'm like, you're right. You got to take a break. And if you're just sitting in the dugout, let your focus go, let it go for a little bit, relax a little bit. So, cause you know, when you go on the mound, you're going to, you're going to need to lock in again. And it does take energy. It takes cognitive energy and effort. So, um, I do, I try to touch base with, with every guy, every inning. Oh, that's great. One of the, one of the things that I am also interested in, because I think that it's something that I have neglected to teach it well in the past. And I'm trying to, you know, recorrect that. And that's, one pre either pregame routines or pre pitch routines of trying to again talk about you know your cognitive load of of being able to focus in and focus out and then being able to focus on what's important and and really you know clear the mechanism as what what the Kevin Costner movie uh, for the love of the game says I, I, forever that will be stuck into my head of <laughs> of on the of of somebody being on the mound and then you know clearing the mechanism I love that but. Uh, also post game routines of okay what do we do well and trying to get that on paper or on a sheet or just something of where it's fresh because the longer the time that goes by the more that they're going to forget so do, do you any, or can you go into what you do pre game game planning or even pre pitch routines if you if you want to talk about that and then post game yeah so pre game um, I, we do, we do all the, we do all the legwork myself, the managers and the coaching staff, we get our scouting reports together and I do create a, a it's about a seven to 10 minute PowerPoint presentation, um, that we do after breakfast before we play an opponent. And it's a lot of big picture things like kind of like I try to summarize what they do offensively, how they generate runs. Do they bunt? Do they run? If they do, what counts do they run in? What innings do they run in? Do they squeeze? If so, when do they do it? Hit and run, all that stuff. Just try to get an idea of generally, you know, what they do from an offensive standpoint. Um, you know, two strike adjust versus do they just continue to, you know, you know, hack away with two strikes. Um, and then when, when we present that stuff from, with the pitchers, like I said, they're in the room. I, I don't, you can get really granular with it. I don't think they need to know again, our guys, we joystick a little bit. This is different than pro ball. Um, most of the time, our guys, we're just attacking the hitter with our strength. That's generally what we do. Now, having said that, obviously situation, how many runners are on base, the score. Um, there's a lot of things that can, can change that. And we will go after a weakness. Like we, and it, again, depending on on the pitcher and how he's doing, um, we'll get after a guy's weakness too. And so we will identify a handful of guys on in the offense. It's like, Hey, these guys, we're not going to let these guys beat us. So we, there's going to be a healthy 
amount of respect for these guys just because we're talking about them in the meeting. I mean, you have to earn that. We only talk about the best guys in our meeting. And and then it's just a lot of video of like, look at how guys have gotten this guy out in the past. It's like, this guy cannot hit a slider. So we're going to slider this guy to death. So just look at it. And so we watch it over and over and over. And I want them walking out of the meeting. It's like, hey, when that guy comes up, I mean, he's good, but I'm going to, you know, he's he has no chance against me because I'm going to, my slider's a plus pitch and I'm going to get this guy. Um, in terms of pre-pitch routine, we, we use the 15 second funnel, um, that Andy McKay talks about. Um, there's no, no reason to, to reinvent anything. Uh, to me, it's perfect. You know, so the first, you know, four to five seconds, you're learning what, what happened with, with the pitch that I threw. Um, then the next four seconds get control with, with breathing. This is where, if you have any type of you know cue or any type of um, something you like to say to yourself to get yourself under control, to clear your mind, clear the mechanism, um, that's when you would do that. Then you're going to get the pitch. You're going to visualize yourself being successful. And then right at the end, you're going to commit. You're all in, right? No plan B. We're going to do it on this pitch. So we, we try to do that with the 15 second funnel. Now we practice it. It's one of those things where if you don't practice it, it's pretty tough to expect somebody to do that in a game. So when we throw our bullpens, we do have a, we have a clock in the, in the bullpen and we don't let a guy, we won't let a guy throw the next pitch until 18 seconds has gone by. So at the first they're the freshmen are like, I don't know what to do with myself. And it's like, well, it's because you haven't, you haven't learned how to do the funnel yet. We're practicing the 15 second funnel. So you have 18 seconds, you might as well practice what we talked about. So they start working on that. And what I like about that is, and I watch them do it, I don't talk to them too much when they're in the bullpen. I just I do a lot of a lot of observing is I get a sense of what their funnel is in the routine. So when they're in the game and that routine is being done every pitch, every pitch, every pitch, it's great. I know they're in a good place. As soon as that routine starts to unravel, I know that the game's speeding up and it's probably time to go have a talk. Um, in terms of post game, um, Adam Shuck, who is one of our head managers, came up with some, they're called WWH reports, what, why, and how reports. So uh, we have three versions of it. One is a, a one pager. We do have a couple of guys on the team that they just, they, they're just not as into the data and the analytics and that kind of stuff. And, and, and sure. we don't force it on them. So they have a version. Mm -hmm. It's a one pager. Um, it's way more qualitative. It's more based on feel. Um, they're going to get a post game report with all of their, you know, everything with percent strike percent, CSW percent, like all that stuff. They're going to get that report. Some of them spend a lot of time with it. Others spend less time with it, but you know, they're, they got a one pager. Then we have a two pager and we have a three pager and the three pager for the guys that really like to dig into that stuff. And we don't expect them to spend a ton of time on that. It's up to them. It's personal. Um, but when they come to throw the pen on Tuesday, um, and I ask them, what are you working on this week? They need to have an answer. So it's not just, ah, you know, I'm going to throw a couple of these. I'm gonna throw. That's not, that's not an answer to me. That's not acceptable. And so if you struggled at all and there's anything that and we can all work on things, um, I expect an answer. So it might be the, you know, I didn't, I was not throwing, I didn't, I didn't hit with one change up. Okay. I didn't hit with one change up last week when I, when I pitched. And so, um, that's what I'm going to work on today. I'm going to work on that. Or, um, we have other guys that'll be like, look, I, I usually get swing and miss on my slider. I had none on my slider. I went back and I pulled up all my edutronic videos from two weeks ago. I went back and looked at old reports, and, you know, two weeks ago when I, when I threw, um, and I was getting all the swing and miss on the slider. I went back and I looked and I could see that the way the slider was profiling, I had like six inches of sweep. Um, and I saw in my report with the TrackMan data, it was just a gyro ball. So I went and I looked at my Edutronic video from two weeks ago and I compared it to what I had the other day and I can see this and this is what I'm going to work on today. So we have guys that will dig in that much and then we have guys that dig in less, but there's an expectation that there's going to be some kind of, you know, self-analysis and that, that self-analysis is going to result into some kind of plan to get better the next week. No, I think that, you know, I, I want to commend you of how individualized each of each of the things that you've talked about is. And I, again, I, I from afar, it, it seems to, that to be the case and, and digging in more with you today. I've really loved listening to that and hearing that. And it, it, it just it shows that Iowa has no ego on how to get players better. You guys just want to make players better on and off the field and <laughs> obviously win games in the process, which which you guys are going to continue to do this year. So I want I I really want to add a, a section in these podcasts to be able to try and simplify data for just really amateur coaches, college coaches, and he, it's it's amazing of how complex even pro ball coaches can get with with de with data. And so 
what would your best advice be for just guys that are swimming in it? Because I, I've been there, I'm here or I'm there anytime I go to baseball savant and I go down rabbit holes, I'm like, okay, wow, there's just so much of this that I can look at. Or if you're a one man team, kind of like you were at one point in time, or most high school coaches that are trying to do similar things to where they have the right plan in mind, which is I want to try and find what's going to help our players get better uh, and kind of what what the sticking points are and where we can find our competitive advantage, but I'm spending three hours a night crunching Excel data. And so how do we, how do we simplify these for, and again, for me, if I was answering this question, I'm having like the high school coach in mind who is doing it all by himself. So what are some different things that you feel like amateur coaches, high school coaches, youth coaches who want to use data to help their players get better? Where do they start? And then kind of what, you know, what advice would you give? Yeah. And so I'll, I'll, you know, I I guess I would answer that a little bit differently if it was from a game perspective planning versus a development. I think, I think what you're probably talking about is more development. So we'll we'll do both. And and I, I feel like, sorry, I've done a terrible job of making really complex questions for you today. And you've done an absolutely fantastic job of hitting every answer out of the park. So I, I do want to commend you on that because I've not done a very good job of, of simplifying my questions for you. And and you've done a, you've done a great job regardless of, of my you know, uh, of my complex questions today yeah, has been tremendous. Um, so from a developmental standpoint, I mean, I think you have to, f- what do you value first? Um, I think we, we all get caught in the trap of like, Hey, I got this new toy it collects this kind of information and, and you let the data, just the kind of the arbitrariness of the data that you're able to collect now be the driver of the process. And, and that's backwards. That's the cart leading the horse. So what is it that you value? Okay. So do you want to hit? Do you want you want you want your team for hit, hit to hit for power? Do you want your guys to throw hard? Do you want to strike a lot of guys out? Do you want to defend? Do you want to put balls in play and not punch out? Like, what is it that you value as a coach and what you want your program? And that can change obviously from year to year. Like, if you have all of a sudden, boy, all my home run hitters are gone. They all graduated, and I've got a, but I got a bunch of sophomores that can really scoot. Um, you know, maybe my values will change. So it starts with that. What are my values? Now I got to ask some questions going to come up with a really good question before you can um, collect data and use data to to uh, drive the process and make it actionable. You have to kind of have a good question. And so for me, you, once you once you identify what you want to measure and the kind of the questions that you have, um, the most simple application of that is using your technology just for direct feedback. There's a real power. Like so if you're by yourself and you just have a radar gun and you have a clipboard and a sharp number two pencil and Google sheets, which is free for everybody, just that and using the radar and yelling out, you know, this is what that the exit velocity was. Um, and then using things like launch angle ropes, um, hanging those launch angle ropes. And I, I, if anybody ever wanted to reach out, I have a kind of a a PowerPoint, uh, just a slide that can give you some, uh, you know, some, a, a process for getting some ropes hung up to get, make sure that kids understand that, Hey, I hit that ball and it's between 10 and 25 degrees from a launch angle standpoint. And then literally just counting the number of times it happens. You just, just things like frequencies. How often did this thing happen? Relaying that from as an, in terms of direct feedback, just that alone can have a a really big positive impact on kids development over time. Now, if you then add that and then you track that over time to show improvement and you get motivation out of that, Um, it actually is information to, to make sure that what it is that you're doing is working because if (laughs) kids aren't improving after six weeks of programming that you put together, maybe it's time to go back to the drawing board a little bit, or at least make some adjustments to what you're doing. Um, once you get that into Google and you want to get a little bit more, um, fancy with it, you know, computing descriptive statistics on things, averages, frequencies, you know, plotting things, um, how many balls did you hit, uh, below the launch angle rope? Uh, how many were within the launch angle rope, how many were above the launch angle rope. And you start, you know, counting those things and keeping track of those things over time and just plotting them and creating some just very simple reports that you can post um, for your kids, again, to keep them motivated and and to make sure that they're improving over time. Once you get things in Excel and you start feeling like you're you're getting a little bit more knowledgeable, um, Excel or Google Sheets, you can calculate, you know, relationships. You can do things like correlations, which can be very powerful. You can begin to group your players, uh, rank order them. For example, just take all your guys, rank order them by slugging percentage. Here are the guys, these seven guys have the top slugging, these guys had the bottom slugging, and then just make some comparisons. 
you know, between them. Maybe you have a blast sensor, which what's the difference in, you know, this, you know, blast sensor data when I compare the low slug guys to the high slug guys. So just parent grouping th- guys together into different groups and making um, different uh, comparisons is, is another way to do it. But I'll be honest, once you, once you get into Google uh, sheets or Excel and you start getting pretty good with that, if you can learn how to manipulate a pivot table, which is just a part of Excel and Google Sheets. You can learn how to manipulate pivot tables. That is a game changer. Once you get into that, uh, that's like a gateway drug for statistics, pivot tables. Because once you get into pivot tables, then the next step is then, you know, SQL and doing data queries and then getting into R. And it's all doable stuff. It's not it's not rocket science, but pivot tables are, are incredibly powerful. And for me, uh, if you if you're able to get some data into some Excel spreadsheets as a high school baseball coach by yourself, pivot tables can be an absolute lifesaver. Oh, that's fantastic. And and I love the progression there, too. So <laughs> you literally went all the way simple to the, now they're using SQL and, and R and I. <laughs> I really like that. That's, that's, that sounds about right of what, what people down rabbit holes will get into. So that's really good. Well, I, I know that, that we're getting to the end of the show and, and Rob and I, man, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. And, and I know that I've thrown a ton of different questions at you that, that have not been easy. And, and you've, again, I, I want to, I want to commend you for doing a fantastic job of answering them all really, really well. But I do, again, with, with these quick hitters, just I want to get to know you a little bit better, what you're learning, what what you're digging into, and then some stuff that we can steal from you. But what's something that you that you've really been digging into lately that you've been learning about that has you excited? So, like I said, I, I mentioned earlier that our strength coach um, has done some certifications with functional anatomy seminars. Uh, that I've been going down some of those rabbit holes. Like they have a ton of uh, ton of different um, resources that Zach has been. Uh, you know, kind enough to share with me just some reading. Um, and essentially what that is, is just, uh, it's a way to improve mobility. Um, I, I, you, you've probably heard of it. I mean, you're, you're in pro ball. A lot of the pro teams are, are doing this stuff too, but it's a way for you to access new range of motion, uh, in a particular joint, but more importantly, it's, it's kind of just based on the neuromuscular piece. So you're, you're trying to get stronger at that end range and then have more motor control at that end range. And you're trying to basically tell your nervous system that, you know what, you can go ahead and let out a little more slack. You can, you can relax the muscle and give this guy a little bit more slack because he's improved his strength and his control at that end range. I love it. So next question is what is a trend that you see in coaching that needs to be simplified or, or changed a little bit, or that they may be going down the wrong rabbit holes. I'm probably the worst guy in the world to ask that because I overcomplicate everything. Um, but <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. I, I I know you set me up on this one, and I, I've thought about this one a lot, probably more than all the questions you've asked. This this one I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about. For me personally, um, I I spend a lot of time teaching the science, um, teaching, I don't, I don't shy away from that. So we teach our guys all that stuff and they got a lot of feedback with velocity and and spin and efficiency and all the data that we get. And it's what I've noticed is it's really easy for guys to get stuck into, in a training mode. And so I've had to be really, really, really deliberate. And it's not them. It's not their fault. The guy's fault. It's my fault. Um, cause I love training and development and tech and velo phases. I love all that stuff. And so when, but, but when we get done with these phases and it's time to get ready to play, it's, you know, getting them to understand that you got to get out of training mode. We're, we're going to take the velocity away. We're going to take the spin. We're, we're not going to show you this data anymore. Like we're not going to give you the direct feedback anymore. This is who you are. You've done a great job. You've developed this is you. This is your gun. You're going to go to war with the gun you got. We're not going to worry about the gun that somebody else has. And so getting them to get out of that training mode and into compete mode um, has been something that I had to that I had to fix as a coach because I, I stayed in training mode for a little bit and our guys suffered for it. So um, we pull all that kind of data away and we add things like strike percent. With, we still give them information, but it's all performance based and, and their ability to kind of th- to command and, and get guys out. Next question, one drill that we can steal from you. And I, and I'm going to, I'm going to double it up on you for one hitting and one pitching drill that your players love. Okay. So I'm going to, I, for me, you kind of heard what I said about drills. I got, I just don't feel like drills are magic. We're constantly switching out our drills all the time. So I guess rather than naming a particular drill, what I would, what I would say is, is I would encourage 
um, the listeners to, to kind of build a library of drills and, and switch things out regularly. Um, you may take some notes or be some things that don't work for certain guys. And there'll be some things that you end up leaving in there permanently because it's really great for another guy. But, you know, I'll quote Eugene Bleeker, you know, all drills are great, but they're all terrible too. It just depends on, on, on the individual guy and the individual situation. So I've been, you know, I'm a member of, you know, of 108 performance. I'm a member of, you know, we've, we've got, um, uh, driveline plus all these different things. I've built a library. I steal everything I can from the internet, everything I absolutely can. And we've got them all broken down into category, um, you know, based on different mechanical inefficiencies. And so rather than a favorite drill, I just encourage you to throw lots at your guys, lots of variability at your guys. Um, and, uh, I, I found that's a, 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 at least for us, a more effective way to get guys to, to make adjustments and become more efficient in the way they move. Oh, fantastic. Great answer. And then finally, everyone wants to know what books everyone is reading or courses, just any, any sort of resources. So if you were able to purchase one resource for all of our guests, what would it be? You know, I, the, the motor learning thing has been something that I've spent a lot of time reading. And so anything by Franz Bosch, obviously, but I'm sure your listeners have, have all heard that, but, um, as opposed to a book, um, there's a couple of good review articles that I've read, uh, in the last week. Um, one is titled coach. Uh, so you want to learn implicitly coaching and learning through implicit motor learning. Um, and it's by, uh, Poulton P O O L T O N and Zachary Z A C H R Y. It was published in 2007 in the international journal of sports science and coaching. And then the other one is called the role of variability in motor learning. And that was published in the annual review of neuroscience in 2017 and the author was Dewale, D-H-A-W-A-L-E. And both of these articles, um, in, in particular, the first one, the uh, so you want to learn implicitly and the, the, the techniques for learning through implicit motor learning techniques. Um, we put together an entire pre-bullpen routine that is based on the techniques of aerialist learning, external focus, and analogy learning um, to come up with a technique that's going to help our guys get into a flow state. We're, so again, nothing mandatory. We don't make our guys do all the voodoo stuff that we come up with, but even if like two or three guys, you know, end up um, jumping on this thing and using it, it, it will have been worth it. But those were two, I thought, two excellent articles. And if our listeners didn't quite catch that, don't, you know, you don't have to hit pause and rewind. I'll, I'll make sure I link it down in the show notes and, and get those from you. But Rob and I, again, I truly enjoyed our conversation today. I love getting to pick your brain anytime that we're talking and we went an hour and didn't talk about food. And so I think that is, <laughs> that is a, uh, that is an accomplishment in itself because I know if, if, if everyone's following you on Twitter around Christmas, then they've seen how, how much that you enjoy that. But I just, again, I appreciate your time and, and I want to open up and, and let you end the show for us. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? Um, just that if you're listening and you are a high school coach or a JUCO coach and you've got a kid that loves tech and loves to work and wants to throw hard, you know, just hit me up. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.